Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now today, in my third episode on Basel World 2018, I'd like to speak about chronographs. And chronographs I've given actually a separate category altogether, because they're a very broad range of watches, and have probably the most popular complications seen in, um, in, in horology. And of course chronographs are extremely versatile in terms of their applications, and what they can be used for. And in this video I won't be including every release at Baselworld, but I've tried to include a, a nice range of different uh, different sorts, from the, the smaller, more niche brands, to the larger, most major, um, the most major players in the, the horological world. And for this first watch I'd like to talk about, I would like to move to Omega, to the Speedmaster. Because there have been several Speedmasters released this year, including a very attractive pulsometer model, uh, based on the, um, the first Omega in Space style of, um, of watch. However, the one which, according to my viewers, in terms of the questions that have been asked, has caught most people's attention, is the new Apollo 8. Now, Apollo 8 was the first manned mission to orbit the moon, and as a result gave, uh, gave, gave everyone a view of both the front and the back of the moon, which is always um, invisible um, when the, the moon's orbiting the Earth. And this mission ran um, in December of, of 1968, and as a result it is the 50th anniversary of this, um, the, this very famous event. As a result, Omega were very keen to produce a watch to pay homage to this, and the Apollo 8 edition is a very interesting hybrid between the standard Speedmaster Professional and the Dark Side of the Moon model. Now, it shares the case with the Dark Side of the Moon, being 44.25mm, however, there is one major change. And this change is that the movement inside this watch is the calibre 1869, which is a skeletonized and decorated version of the 1861, and therefore this model has a tricompax layout which is more similar to original Speedmasters, and is manually wound. As a result, the view into the movement is, is, is augmented and superior to the, the, um, the, the coaxial version, but also this is a watch which is only 13.8mm thick, a full 2.5mm thinner than the, the coaxial automatic version. As a result, this watch will wear much better for those with, uh, with smaller wrists, or those who simply prefer thinner watches, which is a real godsend, I think, for, um, for a watch like this, because bearing in mind it's already ceramic, the, um, the svelte nature of it should, uh, should certainly gain a lot, of, a lot of respect and enjoyment from wearers. There is also an emphasis on the use of black and yellow, with the case, of course, being black ceramic, and then, of course, the, the accents on the chronograph sections being in yellow. Likewise, the, 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 the skeletonization of the dial and, uh, and case back is very, very interesting, because this allows one to see into the movement, and, uh, and allows one to, to be able to see the front of the moon from the front of it, and, uh, and this is, is, is depicted from the topography um, cut out on these sections and plates, and then this is also repeated on the case back, which gives you a view of the back of the moon. And so what this watch presents is a very interesting hybrid between the past and the present, and though I think a lot of collectors do prefer the tricompax layout, in this position, um, in this case, I think it works very, very well to create a watch which does look intrinsically old-fashioned, but with this modern case and this modern execution. And of course the skeletonization and the addition of these, um, these plates of, of moon-like um, surfaces do give a, a really wonderful look at this watch, and I think does make it a, a piece of, um, of highly interesting dimensions and specifications. And certainly this watch does come at a price bump from, uh, from other models, of, at uh, $9,750. But nonetheless, I think it's a, it's a very interesting package, and certainly will, will be something valuable in the future. However, the one thing I will say is I suspect Omega's releases next year will be the most striking of, of the lot, bearing in mind that will be the anniversary of the moon landing. But certainly this is a beautifully executed watch, and I think elements like that racing second track only add to the, um, the beauty of this watch, as far as something completely different from Omega goes. Now, sticking with the concept of uh, composite and, um, and interestingly cased watches, I'd like to talk about this, which is the Takoya Monaco Bamford. And Bamford were a customization company who worked with a lot of Rolex pieces, but these days have changed to working with LVMH in terms of working with Zenith and, and Hoya mostly. And what they've produced in the past are customizations on, uh, on existing models. But this really shows a greater integration between their work and the work of LVMH itself. Because with this watch, we see a watch designed specifically from the ground up by this, um, this, this, this uh, external house. And this, this comes in the form of a, a Calibre 11 style of, uh, of Monaco. And the piece itself is 39mm in diameter, and, uh, and of course retains the same form factor as the original. However, it does, um, it does have this, this very interesting case which is a forged carbon case, which gives this wonderful style of, um, of finishing and shape and, and colour. 
Of course, the beauty of forged carbon is that it gives this highly scratch-resistant finish and lightness to a watch which, uh, which wouldn't be characteristic, characteristic of steel or titanium, for example. Likewise, it's a finish which can't be removed, and so is black all the way through. And this means that you don't have the problems with PVD, for example, or DLC coatings, which do scratch off, but rather gives a completely blackened effect to this watch. Now, to match the case, which is this wonderful forged carbon, we have crowns and, uh, and pushes, which are also finished in this form, though in, that, in, in this particular case they're, um, they're finished in a, a, a smooth, soft black. Likewise, the use of this aqua blue has been seen throughout um, on the, um, the Hoyer logo, as well as the two subdials, and, uh, and on the surround of the, the inside dial. One interesting touch which I particularly like is the fact that the, the Hoyer branding on the crown is also in this particular blue to show a, a complete uh, coloration of the whole watch and not simply a dial, um, a dial only edition. One aspect of this watch which I particularly appreciate is the fact that unlike other options on the market like for example the Speedmaster Dark Side of the Moon, this watch retains the, the same form factor as its, um, its, its technical uh, forefather. And thus, as a result, it will be just as wearable and approachable by a, a user of another another Monaco um, another co another Monaco model. And as a result, you get a, a brilliant uh, look at what Hoya can produce uh, can produce in terms of a different model with different technology and different innovation. Now, I haven't been able to find a definitive price for this watch, but internally it features the Caliber 11, which is of course um, Hoya's um, automatic chronograph movement with the the crown on the other side of the case. And this is a 40 hour power reserve and 59 joules, giving a, um, a very respectful look at, um, at a watch which still allows innovation to be shown and a completely different material for the case, which I think works very, very well in terms of renovating the style and bringing it into the 21st century. Now, Breitling have had an extremely successful Basel world as far as, as new chronographs have gone, and we've seen an updated Navi timer as well as various other models. And I actually won't be speaking about the updated Navi timer B01 in house chronograph because I feel it's a watch with some minor aesthetic alterations, whereas the watches I'd like to talk about today have more fundamental changes, though of course, um, if you are interested, then do look up the, the changes to the, the Navi timer, because it is the icon and the, the unchanging wonder in the, the, the Breitling range. Though today I'd like to address two other models. And the first of these models is the new Breitling Super Ocean Heritage Chronograph. And this has previously featured a, um, a very ubiquitous, I feel, um, Venture 7750, which was designed in the early 1970s and, and is, is certainly a staple of, um, of horology, but I don't, I don't think it's up to the scratch and standards that we now expect from a watch in this sort of price range. And the case remains a 44mm case with a 15.5mm thickness in stainless steel. It is also fully polished to retain that old-fashioned style which, which was typical of older Breitlings, and internally the movement has now become the Breitling B01. And this is a 70-hour um, power reserve chronograph with uh, an automatic winding setup, a column wheel, and a vertical clutch. And the beauty of this is it's a very versatile movement, because it's now used by Tudor in, for example, their, um, their, their uh, Black Bay chronograph. And as a result, it's becoming a more and more important movement, and a very interesting one as far as in-house movements go, giving that tricompact layout, which, which really gives balance to this timepiece. Three versions of this watch are available, with the, the blue dial being a very popular one with those cream subdials, but also there is a, um, a panda version and a reverse panda version as well, depending on what you prefer, with a silver dial and, and black subdials. And so one has the, the, this, this range of options, but likewise these also feature new bezel inserts, which are no longer the unloomed um, painted bezel inserts we've seen previously, but they are now ceramic bezel inserts with a loom pip at 12 o'clock, which we saw updated last year in the rest of the range, but I think which, which deserved this, um, this update to the chronographs this year. The date is also fitted in, in a way which isn't terribly obtrusive at 4.30 with a matching date wheel to the colour of the dial, which was a very, very good choice and a good call. Likewise, the hands have been broadened into greater sword styles, which again help with the old-fashioned style of this watch, and it's presented on either a Milanese mesh style of bracelet, or indeed a, a rubber strap designed to emulate the surface of that. Now, in terms of case build, this watch is a 200m diver, which doesn't seem like all that much, whilst the luminescence on the dial isn't particularly um, uh, clear and, um, uh, and complete, but then this is designed to be more of a dress diver, though those pushes are, are usable underwater. And the price for this piece will, uh, will come at around $7,660, which is just over £6,000 for those in, uh, in England. And I think this should be a very interesting chronograph, with an in-house movement and, uh, and a style which is, is very particular to Breitling, and, and which I, I like a great deal. The second Breitling chronograph I'd like to speak about is the new Breitling, uh, Breitling Chronomat. The Chronomat is a really iconic watch from Breitling, 
of course reimagined as an alternative to, to other models in the aviation line from Breitling. And this particular model certainly doesn't disappoint, because this piece is a 44mm by 16.95mm steel model, which features a tachymeter, a rotating bezel, as well as this triconvax chronograph, with the same configuration as far as movements go as the Super Ocean Heritage. However, whilst this is a pilot's watch, this is a far more robust watch than the, the Super Ocean Heritage is. And this is seen in the change of finishing. Whereas previous chronomats were often very highly finished and polished, this version features a great deal of brushing, which helps to subdue the look of this very large timepiece, and helps to make it look like more of a, um, a more understated timepiece. Likewise, the bezel is thicker and it has a 500 meter water resistance over the 200 meters of the Super Ocean Heritage. However, I feel the design of this watch works extremely well to be able to bridge that gap between pilot and diver, and thus making this watch a very attractive option for someone who wants an all-rounder chronograph. Now, of course, bearing in mind all these changes and, and additional functions over the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage, this model is over a thousand Swiss francs more, where the, the Swiss franc price for the, um, the Super Ocean Heritage is 7,350, whilst this watch comes in 8,370. So a significant price bump, but if you are in the market for a watch with a, a great deal of um, complication and resistance to the elements, then this may be a brilliant way to go as far as chronographs are. Now the next watch demonstrates the fact that uh, a movement which is commonly reviewed as something um, not particularly elaborate or interesting can be a really fantastic asset for a brand. And this is the Zin 910 SRS. And the 910 SRS is a timepiece which I've spoken about already, which I think is so interesting in terms of offering something really different that it had to be talked about in this video. And very often the Velger 7750 is regarded as a movement of the past and something which isn't relevant in this day and age. However, Zinn with this watch proved the fact that it's a very stable, very reliable, and very modifiable movement, which can really serve them extremely well. Now, what's also very interesting about this watch, and is the reason why I wanted to include this above all other Zinn releases, is the fact that this watch is genuinely different in terms of what it offers um, to a consumer at, at a, a reasonable price range in terms of complications. And whilst Zinn's other models are certainly interesting and do show modifications on existing themes, this one pushes the brand into a, an area which, uh, which really has impressed me. And the case of this watch is a 41.5mm by 15.5mm stainless steel affair, with a, a primarily polished element with uh, some brushing on the back of the watch. And then one has a beautiful exhibition case back showing a fully decorated Vajra 7750, but more on that in a bit. And the, the design of this watch is, um, is, is an interesting point because it's somewhere between a driving watch and a pilot's watch, with the blacked out hands and blacked out indices, which allow the watch to be extremely legible, and then of course red is used as the motif for the chronograph, in order, to, uh, in order for those parts of the watch to, to be clearly visible and legible at a glance. Of course, the orientation of the Velger 7750 has been retained, with the chronograph minutes at the top, the hours at the bottom, and the running seconds on the, um, on the left of the case. Likewise, the date is placed on the right, and the pushes are these very attractive pump pushes, which are slightly oversized, but which work very, very well. Also, this, this accentuates the detailing on the dial, which is really phenomenal um, in the various grey uh, graduations around the edge of the dial, and also the fact that the dial is, is very heavily, um, he heavily levelled. So one has a, a flat plane in the centre with a raised Zin logo, and then sunken subdials in several uh, tiers, as well as a, a chaptering showing those graduations around the edge, which slopes upwards. And this creates a fantastic effect for the eye, and a watch which can appear just as dressy as it can sporty, which is quite difficult with the chronograph. Likewise, the crown is nice and large, and this watch is available either on a, a bracelet or a variety of straps, for example, rubber or leather. And beating inside this watch is a very interesting piece, because as I've said, it's based on the Velger 7750. However, they've been made various changes which have, um, have, have really helped to make this watch stand out in a market of, of chronographs. And the first of these is the decoration, which is phenomenal throughout the movement with blued screws and, and uh, propri the proprietary Zinn rotor, as well as detailing on the, um, on the various bridges and so on to create a really very interesting appearance to the movement. Likewise, one weakness, um, or at least what's often described as a weakness, to the Velger 7750 is the, um, the engagement of the, the chronograph. And here Zinn have really refined this with the use of a column wheel, um, and, and this really does, does, um, does help to make the watch um, a more competitive offering for the price it's being offered for. Then, of course, there is the final uh, complication to this watch, which is my favourite, which is that it's a flyback now. So if one presses the bottom pusher whilst the chronograph is running, the second hand will jump back to zero and restart immediately, a very useful function for pilots, but also simply for someone who wants to restart the chronograph quickly and time multiple events in quick succession. 
The pricing for this 100 meter water resistant chronograph um, depends on whether you go for the bracelet or the strap, but it ranges between 3,960 US dollars to 4,260. And of course one gets the, the, um, the knowledge that Zinn's quality of manufacturing is really superb. And of course also the fact this is genuinely a small brand, where all, all the, the care one would expect is taken with each watch. And, and this is something rare in the modern age of mass-produced watches, where the, um, the demand for watches is kept up by limited supply. Whilst here there is genuinely limited supply as a result of the fact that Zinn do make these on a far more personal level than a lot of other brands. Remaining in a similar price range to the Zinn, Bell & Ross have had rather an interesting release this year at Baselworld. And this is their new BRV2-94 Racing Bird chronograph. And the inspiration for this watch was a, a prototype uh, racing aircraft that they designed, um, which remains a concept, but which ins inspired the design of this watch, the coloration, and the forms included. And the watch itself comes in stainless steel in a 41mm, 100m water resistant case, with screw down pushers and crown guards, which create a, a somewhat a Rolex Daytona-esque silhouette, though of course the form itself is rather different, with an H-link bracelet as well, which I think matches the case very, very well in terms of creating that polished stripe down the centre of the strap, in order to, um, to, to, to complement the matted blue bezel and, and also the, the far more sedate colours um, and lines and textures of the dial. Now the dial configuration of this watch is rather interesting, because it features a bicompax layout, with the running seconds on the one side and the 30 minute chronograph on the other side. Likewise one has the, the triple date placed on the, the, the right hand side of the watch, which allows you to see the date wheel in its movement, and of course a small orange arrow allows you to very quickly pick out which date it is. Likewise, the motif of orange has been used in order to, to isolate the chronograph functions, with orange hands being, uh, being for that function. Likewise, the additional coloration on the chronograph subdial really does lend to, to create a, um, a focal point on the dial, as well as that wonderful aeroplane um, style of counterbalance on the second hand, creating an element of, uh, of balance, and also a, a motif back to the purpose of this watch, whilst otherwise this could be mistaken for something like a, a motor racing chronograph. The form and shape of this watch, however, is dictated a great deal by the movement, which is an ETA2894-2, of course with that chronograph module on the top, allowing the, the watch to have this bicompax layout, which is different to a lot of other manufacturers who tend to go for a Virgil 7750, which is of course a fully integrated chronograph movement, whilst this one is more modular. And the, whilst the Virgil 7750 will be more easily serviced and, and ultimately potentially a more stable movement, this one does allow them to have that bicompax layout and gives that particular aesthetic. Likewise, the, the look of this watch has a few characteristics which are also based on that movement, notably the thickness. But they have tried to keep this watch similar to, um, to, to their lines of their three-hand model of this version, with those, those particular hands which have the counterbalance and counterweight as well as having a, a long and, and pointed minute hand, whilst the hour hand is more of a sword shape. Two strap options are available with this watch, the first being the bracelet, which is a stainless steel H-Link style bracelet, with polished and brushed elements, to break up the form of this watch. And this model comes in at the 4700 US dollar mark, and it's worth noting that all of these watches are limited to 999 pieces. Likewise, a calf leather strap option is also available for 4400, giving a more classical look to this, this very modern and, and professionally driven timepiece. Now, from Rolex, we haven't seen any mechanical changes to the Daytona this year. However, there is a new version of the Rainbow Daytona. And this particular version of the Daytona is the, the Rose Gold model, now released, the Ever Rose Gold, rather. And so it features the fully, um, fully um, jewel-encrusted bezel, lugs, and as well as that, the dial. And the watch is, I think, for many, quite a gaudy option, and for over $80,000, this is a, um, certainly an expensive piece as well. But it, do, it does represent a part of the Rolex brand which has always been there, this, uh, this bejeweled side to, to a watchmaker. And I think because Rolex was initially founded really by someone who wasn't technically a watchmaker, but was more of a businessman, it's very understandable that Rolex would place an emphasis on producing these, these jewellery sections of their, their range. Of course, the jewels on this watch are, are placed really throughout. So we see the most obvious demonstration is the, are the either sapphires cut in a, a gradient of colour, or a rainbow, around the edge of the, the bezel, which of course removes the tachymeter, but then frankly this watch does move away from purpose. Likewise, the lugs are, are jewel-encrusted, um, jewel and uh, these feature diamonds. And then likewise, the lacquered dial in black features uh, another range of baguette-cut sapphires in these various colours. Then we have these subdials, which are rather interesting, because they're actually made out of um, 18 karat rose gold crystals, which, uh, which are formed into these particular um, styles on the subdials, which give a, a really unique look, um, different to anything else on the market, and certainly do work to balance this watch very well. 
Of course, through this treatment, the watch has lost its luminescence, but then the, the fundamental concept of this watch is to be aesthetically attractive rather than being as functional as a standard Daytona. Because, of course, if one did want a functional chronograph, one simply wouldn't go as far as Rolex, as far as um, prices go. But certainly I think this does appeal to a certain market within the Rolex brand, and so I can certainly understand why it's been made. Of course, internally, this watch retains the same calibre 4130, with the 72-hour power reserve, 44 joules, the vertical clutch, and the column wheel. So this remains very much a Rolex Daytona, but it's purely an update as far as aesthetics go, and I thought it was worthwhile showing today at least, because it does show a certain change to things in the Rolex line, though admittedly it is purely an aesthetic one. Now the penultimate watch is the Patek Philippe Aquanaut Chronograph 5968A, and the 5968A is a piece which I think is very much an interesting model in, in the Aquanaut range. And of course, bearing in mind the fact the Aquanaut is the more sporty version of Patek Philippe's only sports watch, the Nautilus, this watch works extremely well as far as giving a further complication in a typically subtle and, and very understated way, which I think is very much in line with Patek Philippe's um, way of approaching things. And this piece is presented with a, a phenomenal style of, um, of use of orange and then anthracite and grey. And the dial we see the typical striations and lines of the, the, the traditional Aquanaut. However, where we used to have the second hand, we now have a chronograph second hand and orange elements as well to really break it, break up the dial and create a, a more lively approach to this watch. Likewise, I like the fact that the central um, position of the, the, um, the second hand is matched by the central position of the hour chronograph placed just below it. And before I talk about the movement itself, the watch is, is very carefully sized and designed, bearing in mind this additional complication because we see a 42.2mm stainless steel case, in addition to an 11.9mm thickness, meaning they've been able to keep the watch slim despite that octagonal bezel and, and, and the inherent thickness added by the use of a, a, a chronograph movement. And the, the case itself remains very true to the original, with the same ear around the crown, and then the, the chronograph pushes amalgamated and incorporated into the case very, very nicely above and below. And of course the strap um, of this watch is a rubber strap available in, in black or orange, depending on where you want to go with this. But of course it represents the same quality Patek Philippe always show in their rubber straps, which is what you expect and matches the dial very, very well with those lines. Despite the thinning of the case, we do still see 120 meter water resistance, which I think was important to retain because it did mean this watch still was able to be usable in water, or simply in the pool for example, without those pushes compromising this, uh, this aspect. Visible through the exhibition case back, the movement, or rather the calibre CH28-250C, is visible. And this is, of course, a beautifully decorated automatic chronograph from Patek Philippe, which provides the date and the chronograph functions on this upright line, which is, is I think, very beneficial for the design of this watch in terms of retaining the dial style with those, um, those Arabic numerals. But the movement itself features a beautifully decorated golden rotor, as well as decoration throughout, which is typical of this, uh, this 38,600 Swiss franc watch. Which certainly is a great deal of money, but um, I think Patek Philippe have really hit the nail on the head with this watch, in terms of providing a very interesting alternative to the standard Aquanaut, and in terms of creating something which, uh, which is, is directly in, com in competition with Audemars Piguet chronographs, for example. Now the final watch I'd like to speak about is the Patek Philippe 5270P. And this is a piece which date, dates back to 1941, when the original perpetual calendar with chronograph was released. And this piece is quite an interesting model, because it's not by any stretch a nude piece, but rather is a new piece in this material, in this dial configuration. Now this watch reaches back to 2011, when the original gold version was released. However, now in this 41mm case by 12.4mm thickness, we see a model which is in platinum. And they have also released a model in gold this year on a bracelet with a black dial and, uh, and Roman numerals. However, this piece I think has turned more heads because it is just so much more understated and more delicate. And the piece itself is of course platinum, so it's white metal and provides a, a fantastic luster. Of course the price does reflect this, but more on that later. And the, the, the dial itself is this salmon, and it's a salmon colour which does appear like something from the 1940s, with those, um, those graduations around the edge of the dial with tachometer, as well as the fact that one has these raised and applied indices um, around the, the, um, the edge of the dial in the form of these Arabic numerals. And of course these are only seen on the, on the top half of the dial because the bottom is, um, is rather well, uh, well filled, I would say, with the, the subdials. But we see leaf hands which are also beautifully finished in a darker gunmetal sort of finish, um, but do reflect light beautifully as, I've, as I saw at, at Baselworld. And this creates a, a, very, uh, a very unified look to a dial which otherwise may look a bit, a bit scattered and a bit busy. Now, in fact, this watch has three major complications. 
So we see from the centre of the dial the chronograph hand mounted with also its its uh, matching subsidiary um, small uh, sub dial to match with its uh, its separate minutes. But also one has at twelve o'clock um, the day of the week and the month, and then of course a pointer date at six o'clock. Likewise, this watch will of course uh, work like a perpetual calendar and will of course um, uh, work with regards to leap years until 2100 when they will drop a leap year in order to, um, to synchronise the, the calendar correctly. It does also feature a moon phase at 6 o'clock which is a nice addition and something which, which works very well on this watch too to provide something a little bit, um, a little bit different um, with regards to, um, uh, to, to providing the watch with um, a little bit of variety and, and break up that very crisp and in many ways very serious design this watch has. But the case is certainly a thing of beauty, with the decoration on the lugs being really wonderful, but understated in a typical way which Patek Philippe is so skilled at doing. Now usually I look at Patek Philippe and I think that actually their pieces, in the more simple ranges, are not really very well matched to the offerings from, for example, Elang and Zona, who offer just spectacular complications for the price. However, when one moves into these categories, I think Patek Philippe really pull into their own and create watches which are exactly in line with their brand intentions. And so with this watch, I can say Patek Philippe really have, have shown a tour de force. This is an incredible piece in terms of providing um, an incredible demonstration of their, 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 um, their technological prowess, as well as the fact that they're able to, to show their style of leather straps and, um, and unstated cases with that very typical design language on the dial, which somehow remains clean and, um, and uncluttered, despite the fact that it has numerals on it everywhere. And through the case back, one can really witness and enjoy the calibre CH29-535PSQ. And this is, of course, a manually wound chronograph perpetual calendar movement, but it is presented in a beautiful way. And I'm pleased to say this watch is manually wound, not automatic, because I think it only adds to the beauty of the movement not having a great big rotor, or even a micro-rotor on it. Of course, one can see the balance wheel at the bottom, and then the decoration on the various bridges, plates, and, uh, and wheels. But likewise, Patek Philippe don't show the, um, the column wheel with a small cap placed over it. The front of the movement also shows a wonderful view into this, with the, the various wheels showing the months, the days of the week, the date, and even the leap year um, on that, uh, that small one on the right-hand side. And so this does create a, a wonderful involvement between the owner and the, the movement. And of course, for this price, one can say one can expect it for the price of 165,000 Swiss francs. But it's always beautiful to be able to witness one of these pieces and really see one in, in, in the sense of being a, a technological marvel and a marvel of, um, of, of mechanical beauty as well. Anyway, I'll conclude the video here, but do leave your comments down below as to what you thought of these various watches from both ends of the spectrum in terms of price, but also in terms of purpose, functionality and, uh, and aim in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel and to be able to enjoy more, uh, more content here and also to be able to see the rest of my Basel World coverage in various other categories. So thank you very much for watching. This is Armand the Watch Guy, out.